It's a pleasure to be here. Um, oftentimes I come to these teas and I'm sitting at the table, so the tables are turned a little bit here. Um, but uh, <coughs> I'm really uh, pleased to be here and, uh, and also pleased to um, have collaborated um, with the Center for Desert Archaeology um, over the years uh, on the, the Zuni Origins Project, on our NSF-funded uh, Social Networks Project, on the uh, Preservation Field School, and uh, we also thank the Center for their support of our graduate students through some of the Preservation Fellows. And I think all of these collaborative projects illustrate our shared interest in both preservation and in research, and that you can do both um, at the same time. So um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, Zuni ceramics over time. Uh, it's a long time period, so I'm really just going to hit the highlights. Um, but I'm going to embed this within discussions of Zuni identity, uh, a topic that is dear and dear to many archaeologists' hearts um, right now. Uh, in order to be able to place that in the context, I'm first going to just give you a very, very short uh, timeline, historical timeline. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about archaeological approaches uh, to identity. How do we do it? Uh, and how do we understand um, what people's um, uh, perspectives were on their place in the world uh, from pottery? <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about the pottery itself uh, over uh, different time periods, uh, concentrating on some of the key, sort of what I call hinge points. And hinge points is an idea that uh, Linda Cordell and George Gummerman published in one of their works together, Themes in Southwestern um, Prehistory. I'm not sure if everybody's read that book, but it's a kind of a classic in Southwestern archaeology. And what they did is they talked about hinge points. They talked about important time periods where you see these sort of major transformations. So what I've done is I've identified the, the Zuni hinge points, and then I'm going to tie those to the ceramics uh, so that you can see a little bit about how, those, uh, how things changed over time. But first, let's just look at what do we mean by identity. Uh, anthropologists study identity. In fact, if you do a search of the AAA, the American Anthropological Association's papers, meeting papers, and you go through and you do keyword and you do identity, you'll probably end up with thousands of hits because just about everybody in anthropology talks about identity today. It's something that's in part of what um, people do and it helps to differentiate wh uh, why people do one thing over another. Um, but I, I kind of like to think about identity um, in these two ways. Um, first, um, oh, I'm not pressing this button. I'm only pressing one. <laughs> so I like to think about it in terms of uh, these two aspects. And um, the first one really has to do with the fact that identity occurs at multiple scales. A lot of times we see ethnic identity together, but that's not really the only way that we can think about identity. In fact, it's probably one of the least productive ways of thinking about identity. Instead, we have to think about one person's place and all their connections to other people along many different scales. So that, that those scales can be gender, they can be residence, they can be language, they can be descent. But all of these have some sort of impact on how people think about themselves and how they interact with other people. So it's sort of like thinking about a person within a social network. And we also have to consider the second part of anthropological definitions to identity, and that is that it's mutable, that it's changing, that it adjusts itself even from day to day or even from hour to hour, depending on social context. Certainly it changes when there are major transformations in societies. Um, so depending on our temporal scale, we might have that kind of mutability or that transitivity in identity. So these are two very important facts. One, that think people are part of different networks, and that determines how they consider themselves. And then secondly, that that changes over time and that temporal scales can have a lot to do with it. Okay, so now let's uh, look at uh, an overview of the time period. So we're looking now at uh, starting with uh, the earliest uh, time period I'm going to be talking about. Um, well, the talk said 1300, but I'm going to stretch it just a little bit because the 1200s is such an important time period to understand this very, um, this, this first period. Aggregation. Aggregation re refers to when people are moving together. Uh, the Zuni area saw aggregation uh, in multiple time periods, but particularly during the 1200s. So 1200, and I have put 1350 here, plus it never really stopped, as you'll see from the rest of the talk, but 
this is emphasizing a major period in, in Zuni uh, prehistory when all of these very large sites uh, were founded and occupied. And here, what, some of these are thousands of rooms. Uh, this is from a classic monograph by Leslie Spear that was published in 1917. And then one of the center's uh, great projects, the Coalescent Communities Project, resulted in uh, this graph, which shows the Zuni area, which is right up in here, and you can see it getting bigger uh, here's in, through the 1200s because of aggregation, and then it remains large over here and here, and then you can see at the end what the end of our story is, because there are so many other areas of the Southwest that are depopulated late in prehistory, but Zuni remained occupied. So we have this long occupation with uh, the aggregation being uh, one of the earliest uh, parts of this uh, sequence. Then uh, there's a period that I call migration and consolidation, because Unlike many other areas uh, of the Southwest, where we see a lot of migration in the 1200s, Zuni seems to have um, remained a little bit uh, separate. Um, and a lot of the people who were living in Zuni did aggregate, but we don't see as much evidence for people migrating into Zuni until after 1350. And we, we see a lot of this with the ceramics. So there's a, about a century that's a very uh, a dynamic period uh, that <clears throat> is a harbinger uh, to some of the changes that happen in the ceramics. So I'll be talking about this change uh, in a little while. Uh, European contact, of course, uh, 1539, 1540. Uh, 1539, we don't think that Fray Marcos de Niza made it uh, all the way to Zuni, but certainly Coronado did in 1540, and there's his route uh, coming up from Mexico, and Zuni was the first of the Pueblos that he reached. Uh, the Pueblo world at contact had all of these different language groups, and here's Zuni. Here's the cluster of sites that were occupied at the time of contact. Uh, but you can see the diversity in the Rio Grande Valley, and then the Hopi uh, Pueblos, and uh, Zuni in between uh, the two. A uh, period that I uh, would call missionization, 1630 to 1680, is a very influential uh, time period. Uh, here uh, is the map of Hawiku. It was excavated by Frederick Webb Hodge uh, from 1917 to 1923 with a one-year break. Uh, this is published um, by um, Smith, Woodbury and Woodbury, and um, Ben Smith's father uh, did archaeology a great um, uh, favor uh, by pulling together Hodge's notes. And so this was published as, uh, as Frederick Webb Hodge's excavations at Hawiku in 1966. Uh, uh, the late Natalie and Richard Woodbury wrote the uh, ceramics up for the appendix, and we rely on that quite a bit uh, for the material. Uh, churches were built, uh, one at Hawiku, another one at Halonawa. Um, visitas were built at uh, Kechabawa, another one of the contact period sites, as well as at Kaikima. Uh, the, the photograph uh, on the top is 1896 photograph of the visita, and you can see how much it um, had deteriorated uh, within less of a century, um, but uh, still visible on the surface of uh, Kechabawa. Uh, then uh, 1680 is another hinge point uh, uh, to 1692. Uh, with the Pueblo Revolt. And Zuni was part of the Pueblo Revolt, although it was at the outskirts of much of what was going on in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, all of the Zunis retreated uh, to the top of Doyalani, and here is a map of the room blocks at Doyalani that was done by T.J. Ferguson as part of his dissertation research um, with the uh, approval of the Zuni tribe. And then here's a, a cartoon by Phil Hute, who um, uh, does wonderful, uh, or did wonderful cartoons showing victory of the Zunis on top of Doyalani. This was a key moment because it was the first time that the Zunis had lived together in one Pueblo. Uh, before, they lived in multiple Pueblos. Th uh, the number of contact period Pueblos uh, diminished. We don't know exactly which ones were uh, depopulated first, but at 1680, everybody went on top of the Mesa. And then at the end of the Pueblo Revolt, uh, during what we call the Reconquest period, when the Spanish came back to New Mexico, uh, the Zunis did not go back out to their other Pueblos. They all went to one Pueblo, which is Halonawa. And the original footprint of Halonawa uh, is around this area. This is the very, very center of Zuni Pueblo, uh, with a plaza footprint that goes back probably to the 13th century. 
and then all of these other room blocks were added later, and these, these are added the, late, the, la, um, the latest. <clears throat> so those are uh, all post, um, probably post 1800s, uh, early 1800s. Uh, but that reconquest uh, and this pulling together was another change in identity, and I was telling um, some uh, friends that, uh, earlier that it's very interesting that Zunis have a long traditional history but in none of those traditional histories do people talk about the fact that they came from Hawiku or that they came from Kechabawa or Kaikima. Everybody has the same, that Halonawa is the center place. So we can see how much Zuni identity changed. They do have, of course, traditional histories about origins, about migration, and all of those are before, the hist you know, before time, you know, in time immemorial. And so it's almost like, as if an intentional uh, forgetting of the which families came from which of those contact period pueblos in order to foster a mutual identity at Zuni. And that I think is very is something that we see in the ceramics um, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. So uh, Zuni was not alone in uh, becoming um, uh, consolidated. Uh, here you can see the uh, pueblos occupied before the Pueblo revolt on the left and then the pueblos um, occupied today. So uh, in between 1680 and the present day, there's been a major uh, shift in the number of pueblos occupied, uh, and Zuni was one of them. There's a very brief period, the Mexican period, that we, know, we don't know as much about um, archeologically. Um, I show this slide from 1966 uh, because it shows the mission at Halonawa without a roof. And that's to remind me to say, well, this is when the Spanish fathers when the missions uh, uh, were kicked out of, um, of the, um, the Pueblos. So there, were, there basically was, there, were no, there was no Spanish um, missionary presence um, at, the, at the Pueblo during this time. And this was the initiation of a reconstruction of the mission that took place uh, uh, in association with uh, the Park Service. Okay, and then finally we have uh, the, the American period which starts in uh, 1846 uh, when the um, uh, the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe uh, Hidalgo was uh, signed, or 1846-1848. <clears throat> I'm glossing a little bit here. Uh, and that's the American period uh, ushered in many, many changes. Um, and oftentimes we don't think about what those changes uh, were, what the impact was uh, to people at Zuni uh, prior to the first anthropologists coming in 1879. You know, the Cushing and the Stevensons all arrived in 1879, but the army, um, people traveling the Beale Road, had a huge impact on Zuni, and, and the army in particular needed wheat. So wheat was one of the things that fed the army, and the Zunis established Zuni farming villages outside of uh, Halonawa in order to be able to grow wheat for this uh, market. And that is when um, I am, um, uh, fairly convinced that uh, we have uh, the introduction of, um, of, of actually wheat into the Zuni diet. Uh, wheat was resisted up until that time, um, even though it was a popular uh, item, uh, uh, breadstuff, uh, in the Rio Grande Valley. But Zunis had per per perpetually um, or perpetuated uh, doing um, corn uh, breads in instead of wheat bread. And I think that this was the tipping point for wheat uh, was uh, in the uh, American period, largely fueled by the, um, the army. Okay, uh, this is the population curve, and this is something that we always have to keep in mind when we think about transmission, we think about ceramics, we think about material culture, and that is the impact of uh, the Spanish, uh, of course, uh, the diseases that were introduced. And there was really a, a low point between, say, the Pueblo Revolt and the uh, mid-1800s, uh, when the, um, sort of the, uh, the beginning of the American period. But you can see how Zuni has rebounded. And it's this revitalization in population, a revitalization in the uh, Zuni society, that uh, is also uh, something that we can see in the ceramics. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to do is just briefly uh, talk about where our information about collections comes from, having to do with some of the um, uh, uh, ceramics uh, from Zuni during this time period. And I'm going to highlight ones that I've I worked on because um, that's what um, I know the best. Uh, I've reanalyzed the uh, collections from Hawiku and from Kejabawa. Uh, the collections from Hawiku uh, are the ones that uh, Frederick Webb Hodge, who's seated to the left over here, your left, 
Um, that's Neil Judd and a whole group of distinguished um, visitors. Uh, and then here is his, uh, the map of, of Howie Koo. And I always, my heart always breaks every time I see this. Um, 1917 to 1923, when was tree ring dating? <clears throat> well, not until the late 1920s, right? So <clears throat> 19, early 1930s. So, you know, they, they basically excavated this beautiful roof and then they took all the beams and put them in a pile and we don't know when it dates to. So, uh, <clears throat> but we do have lots and lots of pots. And I was um, very privileged to uh, be able to do uh, a number of trips uh, to uh, the uh, old Hay Foundation. Uh, this is when they were up on uh, 150, well, they were, their exhibits were at 155th and Broadway and then they had their storage area was in the Bronx. Uh, and now this is all part of the National Museum of the American Indian Co um, Collections, which is a, a fantastic uh, collection. These are covered with dust because their air conditioning uh, or at the time was to open the windows. So they are literally uh, covered, um, covered with dust. Uh, fortunately, when they were moved, they were, uh, they were cleaned up and I was able to clean a lot of them as I was working with them uh, very carefully. Um, there are other collections. This is uh, very close to the four-way stop that uh, Bill showed a slide of uh, from the air. This is, these are excavations for one of those retaining walls. Uh, so this is uh, where the sand drops off. And this is the trash mound on the north side of Zuni Pueblo. And there are also collections from Zuni Pueblo. Um, I analyzed a lot when I was working for the tribe um, uh, that was part of a water line project where we got to follow all the trenches and then do some um, uh, sampling of the ceramics. And then uh, there was a restoration project uh, most recently done uh, in the middle village itself. This is the architect's model. Uh, these are some of the excavations that were conducted, um, the test trenches, uh, over here, and the tribe invited me to do the uh, ceramic analysis for that. We did that up in the Southwest Lab um, at the School of Anthropology, and then we also had an NSF grant um, that followed. And from that, um, I was able to do a ceramic seriation that basically demonstrated what Spear had already told us in 1917 and Krover even before that in 1915, and that is that there are alternating uh, technologies uh, that uh, are very uh, well dated uh, at Zuni. And we start out with a glaze on white or red, and then a matte paint with some glaze on white. Uh, then it's a buffware with matte paint, uh, and then a red and white slip again, uh, contemporaneous with this, uh, with glaze paint, and then an all matte paint. So this is basically, in a nutshell, about 800 years of Zuni ceramic change. And I'm gonna go into uh, this in a little bit more detail. And then I have this one up here because this is the odd, the odd bodkin, you know, the odd pot out because Zuni's never made a smudged redware. And there are a lot of them at Zuni and they occur contemporaneous with um, some of these other types like these over here. So, um, and before this type. So that's one of the reasons that we can look at migration, for example, be, um, because we have this influx of uh, very unusual pottery. So how do we get at identity uh, with pottery? Uh, we have this anthropological definition, but how do we get at it with um, uh, material culture? Well, archaeologists are getting a lot more ecumenical about how they approach uh, looking at identity. Uh, we take lots of different approaches. We uh, try to um, not avoid what's obvious, and we try to um, uh, quantify as much as possible. Uh, and these are some of the different ways, uh, sort of terms that you see in the literature that are, are still being used. One of them, communities of practice, which includes looking at the actual technologies and their transmission. So tying very specific ways of doing things, the choices that people make along the way in making a pot, in order to be able to tie together whether or not they are the same, um, in, um, part of the same group, or the same, what we call, community of practice. Uh, active stylistic signaling. Uh, many times there are highly visible designs, sometimes highly charged iconographic images, uh, such as Kachina imagery that we also use to look at identity and uh, we can look at participation in particular kinds of groups through that. There are distinctive tools of cuisine. Some cuisines require certain kinds of pots and other kinds of material culture, so we also use those because cuisine is something that's very, very conservative. It, it changes very little. Containers in religious contexts, uh, special forms that are used, uh, for example, prayer meal bowls, 
or um, maybe some figurines or individual serving vessels used by initiates. These are all uh, specific contexts that sometimes we can trace. It's a little bit harder to do that um, because form does not always equal function. And then uh, the one that I'm very interested in are abrupt technological or stylistic changes. The intentional abandonment of uh, certain kinds of techniques or styles because of their changing context, the social context or changing identities. Uh, this is something that I think a lot of times we've explained by demography or by sort of external causes when in fact people made choices. They, they intentionally gave up making a pot a certain way in order to be able to make it in another way. And when everybody does that all at once, that to me is something that's really um, significant. And that's what I'm going to focus on along with a few of the others um, in, the, in the remainder of the talk. Okay, so here is, here is one of the, um, the dramatic changes that occurred. This is that period of aggregation and what happened during that time period. People invented glaze paint. Well, <clears throat> I also work in the Silver Creek area of, um, in the Mogollon region. We think we have the earliest glaze paint, but Zuni certainly adopted it very, very quickly um, and incorporated it into their technological uh, repertoire. And they did it on white-slipped um, pottery on the left, the Quakina polychrome here, as well as what um, is called Heshatutla polychrome. And this all dates to the late uh, 13th century um, in, into the 14th century. And it, these are the most common types, at, um, particularly the polychromes at these large aggregated uh, pueblos. Now, something that I've argued is that uh, the use of um, these exterior designs that are very common with these glazed paints starts just a little bit earlier, um, but I've, uh, um, I think that they're because of the performance characteristics of these particular pots, that when they're full and when they're carried, you can see them at a distance. So they, they have the red and the white combinations. Um, here is a Hopi um, mural, uh, probably a buffware with some other uh, designs on the outside um, that show how, when they're filled with food, um, what you would see. So I think that these designs on the exterior were a way of people expressing their membership in a group and particularly in demonstrating their um, participation in these uh, supra-household feasting uh, ceremonies. And we see these increase over time uh, with, um, in this particular um, few centuries. Then there's a really interesting um, kind of shift, which is all white slip. And the, some of them are uh, with glaze paint, and I think all of these have glaze. That black is, is a glaze paint. But what they've done is instead of doing red and white slip, they're now doing all white slip. And there are some archaeologists uh, in the Zuni area, who've worked in the Zuni area, um, the um, uh, preservation archaeologist Deb Huntley is one of them, um, other uh, students who uh, are worked with Keith Kinty from Arizona State University, who have pointed out that white slipping seems to be very, very common in the Zuni area. And it seems to differentiate some of the Zuni types of this time period from other types um, in surrounding areas. It's not something that you get as widely, and particularly you don't get it at Hopi. So maybe Hopi and Zuni are distinguishing themselves uh, during this time period. Um, these are very interesting, these uh, two in the bottom, these are not polychrome, these are glaze on white and then just a red on white. But the, design, the designs on these are, are much more similar in terms of layout to some of the designs that we see in southern New Mexico at about the same time. In fact, um, for those of you who know the type, San Carlos red on brown would be a very common, um, would have a common um, uh, design layout. Oh, and that, some people have argued that's the first shallico. <coughs> But uh, other types of motifs that you get on these pots are parrots, uh, and you also get them on these redwares, but parrots are very common. And we still would have had the uh, trade with Casas Grandes happening during that time period. But this is kind of, this is, this is the odd bodkin, are these redwares with smudged interiors. Uh, some of them uh, are, are jars, uh, like the one on the far right with the parrot designs. Um, but others um, have these very bold uh, white um, designs on red. And these have no precedent in Zuni. They occur with uh, salado polychromes, like this uh, Gila polychrome jar. These are all from Ketchapowan. Uh, and, uh, and these slides, um, the ones with the blue backgrounds from Ketchapowan were taken by Brenda Shears um, from a Arizona State University. Um, and, but uh, because they occur, uh, so, and they come in so dramatically, 
Um, I've interpreted this as uh, the period of, of migration and reorganization after 1350, from 1350 to 1450, where you have this amalgamation of individuals coming from areas that are no longer occupied in southern New Mexico. So these, this would be like the upper Gila area, um, all the way up, up to uh, the, um, uh, the Mogollon Rim. Some of the late occupied sites from that area date as, as late as 1400, maybe 1450. Uh, but this, to, to me, seems like a, uh, a large-scale um, introduction. And along with that are changes in cuisine. Uh, these shoe pots are, uh, occur in the same assemblages. We don't have any precedence uh, for those. Those are a cooking vessel. Uh, we have the first peaky stones, uh, paper bread. It's called heiwe uh, at uh, Zuni, uh, where uh, people, um, corn is made into a gruel and then put onto a, a slab very quickly. The earliest peaky stones date to this time period. Uh, so uh, I, I think that this is a, a, a all underscores this major change um, and amalgamation of new introductions uh, to the Zuni diet. And then the Zuni uh, migration stories themselves talk about people coming in from the west, uh, people coming, going to the south, and then going uh, to the south, and then coming back up to Zuni. We don't know the dating of these, but it is in the, uh, the oral histories that there are these migrations from the west, from, from the south. And I, I think that a lot of these uh, do date to the, um, this important time period. Uh, and here is where those, some of those sites are in the late period. This is from Adams and Duff's uh, book. Uh, but here are some of the very, very late occupied sites in the Upper Gila. And then, of course, Zuni would have been one of the closest places for uh, these um, individuals to um, migrate to after they depopulated the southern area. Um, what's really interesting is that right after this depopulation, they stopped doing glazeware. So they stopped making that white-slipped, glaze-painted uh, ceramic. They moved to a completely different slip color, a buff ceramic, and they stopped, uh, and they paint it with matte uh, paints, black and red and occasionally white. So right around 1450, there is this major shift, and, I, and um, Greg Schachner, um, who's at UCLA, and I have both argued that um, we think that this is um, a, an intentional um, break with the past, that uh, you had people living in Zuni, and then you had the migrants who came in with the redware and the slipped, um, the, excuse me, the smudged surfaces, and that um, in order for everyone to have a shared identity, um, there was um, a, a shift to a, uh, a single uh, ware. We know these are made at different villages. They, the pastes are all very different, but it's the color combinations. What you would see at first glance that is um, a, a major change uh, from what came before. And they made this for 230 years, as far as we can tell. So the same wear has this stability for 230 wares. And there's a lot of variability because of it. Um, and you can see um, there are hemispherical bowls, there are shoulder bowls, there are necked jars. There are, it's a variety of different uh, kinds of um, forms. There are, there are um, is a variety of different kinds of designs. And um, one of the um, things that is very interesting about um, these Matsaki vessels and also about um, some of this idea about migration is that at both Quechabawa and at Hawiku, two of these long occupied sites, there are distinctive cremation ceremonies or, or, or cemeteries, excuse me. And these um, have been identified by Todd Howell in his uh, dissertation research. So people kept, um, even into the period that Matsaki was being made, they kept burial traditions that were very distinctive um, from the uh, original traditions that were practiced at Zuni. So I think that not only does this provide support for the migration, but it also suggests that people, um, even when they have a shared ceramic tradition, that they were, um, uh, had some differences uh, that were underlying uh, their, um, uh, their society. So th this is one of the most fascinating things about Zuni that, um, and a lot of Zunis don't realize that, um, that a lot of their ancestors uh, cremated rather than um, did inhumation. So um, the earliest Matsaki polychromes uh, are the first that show the Kachina cult. Uh, many of you who have read uh, 
Chuck Adams' work on the Kachina uh, society or Kachina religion probably know that he uh, points out that the earliest Kachina masks on, in murals, on rock art, and in ceramics occurs in, in the 1300s. But the Matsaki was not made until the 1400s, and we don't have any Kachina imagery in the previous ware in, in the Binawa and the other glaze painted uh, white ware. So um, it looks like the Kachina cult, or the Kachina religion, was a late introduction to Zuni. Um, but they did adopt it. Um, they adopted it, it looks like, around 1450, right with the earliest of these Matsaki uh, polychromes, because you can see very clearly on them the, um, the imagery. Um, and here are some of the drawings from uh, the um, Hawiku monograph. But what's um, interesting um, is that they become more hidden over time. So the early ones are really obvious kachinas. You can, you can even uh, try to make a one-to-one -one correlation with um, some of the kachinas that are extant today. But the later ones, they're a little bit more hidden. Uh, it's a little bit harder to differentiate the eyes um, to see where the, the head is. And I think that some of this may have to do with the fact that this is, these were made during the Spanish uh, period. So this, is a, this Matsaki continued to be made into the mission period after 1630. And then I think that um, there must have been some uh, repression of the, um, the imagery. Um, as we know, the Spanish repressed the religion itself. Some of the late Matsaki polychrome also shows uh, evidence of uh, conflict. So there, it, there's, uh, there are shield designs on some of the pots for this time period. The one on the left uh, looks more like a shield design. The one on the right is probably one of these more hidden kind of kachinas. These are, I think, uh, much more um, uh, definitively shield designs. You can, you can see these uh, kinds of designs in some of the, uh, the Rio Grande um, area as well. But they're basically eagle feathers and corn and eagle feathers and clouds. So there's a lot of um, uh, interesting um, imagery. But I think that this goes back to the, the conflict that was happening and the, the, you know, the, um, probably the differentiation between Zunis and um, Europeans, uh, if not um, between some of the, the Pueblos themselves. And then I, I, I like to show this one on the right in particular because um, you don't get any of the uh, Roman crosses until the late form, which is the shouldered form. So some people at Zuni were identifying with Catholicism uh, during this time period. And uh, that's always been a point of, um, of uh, some uh, identity uh, conflicts um, at Zuni is between those who supported the Catholic Church and those who did not. But these, uh, I think this potter probably did. And then, of course, we have Spanish forms uh, at Hawiku, uh, which shows the influence of the Spanish on the potters themselves. I think some of these were commissioned uh, by the, the uh, mission fathers. Uh, certainly the candlesticks, uh, and most of these do come from the cluster of, of rooms around the mission itself at Hawiku. Uh, they made soup bowl shapes, like the one on the left. They also made footed vessels for the first time. Or when, uh, th that's a, that's a, a new kind of um, a technique that was, um, that was introduced. And they reintroduced a glazed paint. So at the same time that ma the late Matsaki polychromes were being made, uh, and between 1630 and 1680, when the missions uh, were built at Hawiku um, and at Holonawa, uh, they, uh, the Zunis started painting with a glazed paint again. So the long period, over 200 years, or almost 200 years, not having any glazed paint, and then all of a sudden it comes back again. And I think that some of this has to do with the, um, the Spanish uh, re, uh, influencing and, and, and suggesting that people reintroduce it. Fray Latrado, who was one of the mission fathers um, at Hawiku, came from the Salinas Pueblos. And of course, the Rio Grande Pueblos never stopped making glaze paint. So you have this long trajectory of glaze paint production. And I think that he either brought potters from the Rio Grande or suggested to the potters that they make them, maybe because they wanted them, um, for the, um, uh, for the, uh, the Europeans who were at Zuni. Uh, but the Zunis took hold of this and became very, very creative and started making uh, what we call Hawiku polychrome. Um, there are very few religious, um, religious iconography. Um, there are f lots and lots of feathers. Uh, I really like this one on the upper right uh, because it looks like a Maiolica bowl. It looks like a Spanish 
form and a Spanish glaze, uh, but made in all local technology. So this is uh, clearly a, a Zuni pot. So Zuni in the Pueblo world in the 17th century was a cluster of Pueblos, um, some of which were depopulated by 1630, uh, but uh, several of them were occupied during the time that this, of the mission uh, period. And uh, Zuni did participate, as I said, in the Pueblo Revolt, um, just to remind you, at 1680, and they um, moved to the top of Doyalani. Uh, the only shirts, the polychrome shirts I've seen up there are the Matsaki. So they didn't, um, I haven't seen Hawiku, that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, but the big question is when did they stop making Matsaki polychrome? Um, because when they came back down uh, from Doyalani and occupied Halonawa, um, they started making a whole new wear. So very similar to this rather dramatic change uh, following that migration and, co and coalescence in the 1450 uh, time period, uh, in the late um, 17th century, after they repopulated uh, Halonawa and lived all together in one village, um, the technology was completely transformed. Matsaki buffwear was not made anymore. They abandoned the buff uh, slip. And then Hawiku glaze polychromes are, uh, uh, were no longer made. So they abandoned the glaze paint. And there's been a lot of discussion about why they would do that. Um, I've hypothesized that uh, the glaze polychromes were no longer made because of their association with the Spanish. And a critical uh, fact is that the baptismal font at Hawiku was apparently out of, uh, was Hawiku polychrome. So there was this direct kind of association with the, the glaze polychrome. But again, I, th I think that what this, um, this change represents is very similar to the Matsaki buffware um, uh, early production, and that is that they wanted to do something different and break with the past. So it's an intentional break with the past to do something new that d wasn't associated with the earlier uh, population, with the earlier um, villages. And they make this beautiful uh, white slipped uh, and red slipped ware with black uh, mineral paint uh, some red out uh, in, in filling. Um, this is a very famous pot because it's the one that uh, was the first accession in the School of uh, Advanced Research uh, Collections, uh, the Indian Arts Fund. It's got Indian Arts Fund number one written on it. <clears throat> but it's a beautiful pot, and this is, of course is from Mira's um, beautiful uh, publication out of the Laboratory of Anthropology doing those rollouts. And you can see eagle feathers, you know, things that are um, uh, announce their, the, um, the, both uh, the value of feathers, but also that these are um, prominent um, uh, birds uh, in the pantheon. And here are so, just some examples. And it's so ironic because at the end, uh, or it's ironic because the uh, Oshawi polychrome, the only absolute dates that we have come from Navajo Pueblito sites. So there aren't any absolute um, dates from, from the Zuni reservation or surrounding areas for this particular pottery type. We have seriation, but it was um, Roy Carlson's um, write-up of um, uh, Morris's excavations at uh, these sites that brought this to the attention of a lot of folks. And then Ron Towner uh, more recently uh, went and redated these uh, particular uh, sites. And we have tree ring dates in the 1720s to 1750s. Um, I like to show this slide because this shows that not all the forms are, have this wide um, mid-body, uh, but there are also some that are more globular. And you can begin, I'm sure you're, those of you who ha know Zuni pottery are anticipating um, the next slide, <coughs> which shows Zuni polychrome. Uh, this is the, the, the type that we think of sort of more iconically uh, when, we, when we think about Zuni pottery in the historic period is this beautiful white slipped uh, ware. And the white slip was something that potters strove for, is to get that clean and white and the black to be crisp. And then you'll see a lot of diagonal use. Um, there's a lot of variety. You know, the classic uh, deer in a house, but there's lots of other um, uh, design uh, element uh, variability that's used. Uh, these are all from the Smithsonian Institution. I had another grant. Um, Lori Webster, many of you know Lori. Lori Webster took these photographs, um, and it was part of a grant to look at standardization in the 19th century pots and then compare it to 
the uh, contact period POTS. And what we found was that there was a lot of standardization in both, that there were probably some specialist potters in both the late period, in this late uh, um, the 19th century POTS, as well as the earlier POTS. Um, the, um, these are all from the Stevenson collection, um, Cushing, uh, 1879, with the Stevensons, and then the Stevensons in the early 1880s. They filled railroad cars full of material culture from Zuni. Uh, the railroad went into Gallup, through Gallup in 1881, which allowed them to pack up and, and move um, a, um, a lot of pots. And Margaret Harden, who has studied uh, these um, late uh, vessels, uh, points out that what they probably did kind of unwittingly um, in order to preserve Zuni pottery was to take away the models for decoration so that the potters didn't have these because what they were buying were whole vessels out of people's houses uh, and then giving them um, money so they could buy new ones or in, in some cases commission new ones. Uh, but we, um, Margaret and I did a useware analysis and we saw in the earliest collection, the 1879 collection, that there was a lot of useware on the pots. So people were giving up their oldest pots. And then when you compare the two later collections, there's an uh, uh, incremental decrease in useware. And you can see that people were, for the money, were giving up their more recently made um, and owned pots. And it really is too bad because uh, it did take away these models. Now, uh, many of you have seen Zuni pots in collections, and um, now I, I know everybody in this room will be able to pick out a 19th century Zuni pot uh, because of this um, very homogeneous uh, use of exterior designs. It's basically a feather, sometimes on the diagonal or attached to a diagonal like this or like this. Um, almost every Zuni bowl was decorated like this, and it started in the um, uh, early, well, probably mid-1700s, uh, uh, and, and continued all the way, uh, well, even, it's even true today. Uh, and Ruth Bunzel, who did a lot of interviews with uh, potters, with Pueblo potters in the 20s and published in the 30s, interviewed someone um, at Zuni, a woman potter, and she said that you know, the men plant prayer sticks, but we paint our pots with feathers. And that was, being, that was how they were part of, the, um, of, of their participation, their identity um, at Zuni. And here are some more. Uh, but the outsides may be very redundant and homogeneous. Um, the insides show tremendous amount of creativity, uh, even to the extent of having red and white slips. I wanted to close on just a little bit more about the, uh, the modern, uh, uh, con the contemporary context um, at Zuni. Uh, the, there are a lot of vessels that are still heirloom vessels. Uh, people keep uh, mostly bowls, and that is because uh, they like to serve their stew in these bowls. And there are potters who uh, are commissioned by Zuni families, um, even today and all the way through the, the um, 20th century. Uh, to uh, make uh, stew bowls uh, for uh, individual families. And that's because of the importance of feasting. Feasting has been part of Pueblo life. Um, no ceremony is, is done without feasting, is what some of the anthropologists wrote about Zuni and other um, Pueblos. Um, on the lower right, you can see people baking bread. Um, the, the dough bowls are, are generally not used anymore, made anymore, um, and used. Uh, they've been replaced pretty much by metal. and. Uh, plastic. Uh, making bread, though, is very, very important. And as I said, I think that this is really a mid-19th century uh, development because of the army. Um, before that, they would have done hayway. So those ovens are prob we don't have very many of those early ovens um, at Zuni. But, but ceramics continued um, to be made probably because of this commissioning. And I think it is probably what helped to keep the, um, the craft um, uh, the art um, going through the, the uh, 20th century, um, in addition to some for tourist um, uh, production. Uh, but there was really a dive in production uh, um, at Zuni. And it wasn't until the late 20th century that uh, Jenny Latte uh, was uh, uh, instrumental in reviving uh, Zuni pottery making. And she was an art teacher, so she taught pottery in the high school at Zuni. And she took people out to go clay collecting. Uh, she taught them how to, to make Zuni uh, pots. 
She was Akama, married to uh, a Zuni man, but she, ta she was very clear when she instructed the students that they should make them in the Zuni form, not in the Akama form, that they should decorate them with the Zuni designs and not the Akama designs. So she was a really good teacher in having that versatility, but also in seeing how, um, how to maintain it. And that's an art fair uh, in the late 1970s, um, and I was asked to be a judge at one of, uh, um, a couple of these. And so you can see that they were uh, using some of the models from the Zuni polychrome, uh, the earlier Zuni polychromes. This, these are straight from Smithsonian pots. Margaret Hardin gave them notebooks full of the photographs so they would have them in the art room so that the, the, the kids could use those as inspiration. Uh, and then this one is really a very accomplished, uh, good use of space. You'll notice, of course, the feathers on the outside, right? Um, some of these potters are now the ones that uh, are, have been uh, winning uh, all the ribbons at the shows now for uh, probably about two decades. Um, so Jenny is, is responsible uh, for this. And that's really what I wanted to close on was that, um, that feasting is a context uh, for the uh, perpetuation, uh, for the construction uh, of identity. Uh, and, and the way that ceramics are used in these feasting contexts has been uh, both a way that ceramics have been transformed, but also how we see continuity and the perpetuation of the ceramic tradition um, at Zuni and, and at other pueblos. So thank you very much.